I would very much like to welcome the Honourable Dr Nick Smith up onto stage to address our delegates. Thank you, Nick. Uh, kia ora huu hui tātou katoa, can I acknowledge Nick and thank him for the uh, warm welcome uh, and introduction. It reminded me 21 years ago when I arrived in Parliament, and some of you may have remembered a crusty old character, Sir Robert Muldoon, and uh, when he heard I was a doctor, he simply asked me, are you one of the ones that make you well, or one of the ones that make you suck? <laughs> <laughs> I hope this morning I make you... Uh, the former. Uh, I want to uh, acknowledge uh, the chair of Landcare Trust, uh, Richard Thompson, and the other partners, uh, Fish and Game, uh, Fed Farmers, uh, Women's Division, a woman, uh, Rural Woman New Zealand, uh, and others that are both the founders of the organisation and for their ongoing commitment uh, to Landcare's work. Uh, again, uh, I want to acknowledge uh, our Australian family uh, that are here for this land care conference. Uh, it's interesting for me that for all the rivalry that occurs on the rugby field and other sporting endeavours with Australia, it really is a test when you come to tragedies like Pike and Christchurch that really does show just how strong the bonds are between New Zealand and Australia and it's good that land care is also involved at an incredibly deep level in terms of those uh, trans-Tasman bonds. Uh, I also want to acknowledge very much the trailblazer work that Landcare has done in creating a foundation that has enabled the work of the Land and Water Forum to make some gains at a national level. In my view, you very much have been trailblazers in the sort of culture change that's going to be needed uh, if we are to have a more sustainable uh, approach uh, to our core New Zealand industries. This morning I want to begin by giving you a bit of an overview of what are the key drivers around uh, our government's approach to environmental challenges. I want to talk about some of the legislative program that we've got underway over the next uh, 18 uh, months, two years, and then to talk some specifics around uh, particularly water. Firstly, can I come to that framework? Uh, we, uh, six years ago, when in opposition, produced a document called a Blue-Green Vision for New Zealand. And in that, we emphasised four key values that we wanted to take to the mix of biodiversity, water, oceans, coastal management challenges. The first of those is very much in that sort of notion of blue-green, and wanting to bring together policies that recognise the importance of economic success for our country, of being able to grow our economy, but being able to do so in such a way that we are proper stewards of all of New Zealand's many dimensions of our natural environment. The second key driver is to make sure that our environmental decision making, whether it be national, regional, district or community level, is science-based. You know, I've been around political arguments over the environment for 20 years, and the truth is that there will be controversy in no matter what you do. But it is my view that the long-term secure ground is when we base those environmental decisions on good science. And that has got to be actually at the core of actually how we get both environmental and economic gains for New Zealand. So science plays a very important role. The third driver is this notion of getting greater degree of collaboration. Uh, it is uh, our government's view that New Zealand has been poorly served by the highly polarised arguments, the almost British notion of you're either uh, for us or against us around any particular issue, that that has not served us well and that we need to get parties to working uh, together to find solutions. Uh, and so whether it's been in the marine space, whether it's been the increased funding support, Nick, for the Landcare Trust, whether it's been our work 
with the discussion in the Mackenzie country, the fixing of the lakes in Rotorua, there's been a very strong flavour around trying to get various parties to collaborate. And as Minister, the game I've been trying to play is rather than rewarding those that take those very polarised extreme positions, actually trying to reward those that bring people together and find solutions. And then the fourth part of our broad blue-green agenda has actually been taking a stronger degree of leadership at central government level. That is our view is that we are a country of just 4.5 million people and that it's not efficient for us to be re-scrambling the egg 78 times across each of our councils or hundreds of times in each of our communities. And if we actually are to be more productive and to make more efficient decisions, then we need clear essential government direction. And it is our broader view around our resource management reforms that that act has historically been too devolved and that we need to make greater use of some of those national tools. So I re-stress those four underlying principles that drove our policy over our first term in government. On Saturday, this weekend coming, we will be holding our annual Blue Greens Forum and we'll be publishing a new updated uh, Blue Green document to set our agenda for the next three years. And I'd invite those that have an interest in this space to get a hold of that document, which will be available both in printed and web form, so you get a clearer idea across the environment space uh, as to that agenda. I do want to talk about the future of community-based environmental management because from my perspective, getting that engagement at community level that goes at the core of the Landcare Trust work is going to be in increasingly important. But I also want to just take you through four of our particular environmental priorities uh, for the next year. The first of those is to pass and implement new laws to protect New Zealand's huge ocean area. We have a space of 650 million hectares or 20 times our land area, known technically as the exclusive economic zone in the extended continental shelf. And the issue is that the jurisdiction of the Resource Management Act ceases at the 12 mile limit of the territorial sea, yet we need to have a robust system for assessing the environmental impacts of activities in that wider ocean environment. You need look no further than the Gulf of Mexico oil spill disaster in 2010 to see how horribly it can go wrong. A key conclusion of the subsequent inquiry there, which has application well beyond just the issue of oil spills in the ocean environment, was that governments need to be careful to have an independent regulator separate from the government agency responsible for pro promoting mineral exploration if you are to robustly manage those sorts of environmental risks. And effectively, it is that core philosophy that has driven the establishment of the Environmental Protection Authority as an arm's length regulator. As I've said, balance is at the core of the government's broader environmental approach. There are significant opportunities for New Zealand from minerals in New Zealand's exclusive economic zone, the fourth largest in the world, and our legislation is about taking up those opportunities in an environmentally sustainable way. The next major legislative priority uh, is a new Environment Reporting Act to improve the integrity of New Zealand's clean green brand. We're actually the only OECD country that does not have a statutory system of nationwide environmental reporting. This is significantly out of step with the importance that New Zealanders put on their environment, it being part of our national identity, it being crucial to our core industries and to our quality of life. I intend establishing a nationwide five yearly report that, for instance, ranks New Zealand's rivers from the cleanest to the dirtiest which identifies those which are improving and those which are deteriorating to actually help focus communities on how they are looking after that precious resource. To ensure that those reports have independence and integrity, the intended author is the Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment. And for you to understand the broader picture of which I'm attempting to establish is the Environment Ministry, is sort of the brains trust, the policy unit within the government's environment space. 
the Environmental Protection Authority as the independent regulator and then an expanded parliamentary commissioner for the environment uh, as the auditor uh, of that system. I note that Dr Jan Wright, whose presence I acknowledge, is talking to you next about understanding the science of water quality. This is very apt. It is setting a strong scientific underpinning for the expanded role that the government has in mind uh, for her office. My next environmental priority is improving the management of fresh water. Few New Zealanders appreciate just how blessed we are as a country in having the second highest per capita freshwater resource in the world, nor for that matter how much of our export earnings and energy industries depend on that freshwater resource. In our first term in government, we established the Land and Water Forum, which produced uh, by consensus across 58 groups a way forward for improving how we manage uh, water in New Zealand. The government is committed to spend more than $300 million on cleaning up some of our freshwater resources, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of that broader package. Last, but by no means least, is the priority work stream of improving the Resource Management Act. The first phase of our RMA changes were put through the Parliament in 2009 and have delivered real benefits in areas like sort of processing those small non-notified resource consents. We need to be sure that we don't equate good environmental law with those processes that are bureaucratic, slow and expensive. I'm pleased that the number of late consents that grew from 18% to 31% between 2002 and 2008 has now been reversed. In 2008, that translated to 16,000 people whose resource consents were not processed within the statutory timeframes. Those changes we made in 2009 have reduced that to just 5%, or 1,800 late consents. That means 14,000 fewer New Zealanders facing the frustration uh, of slow resource consent processes. Another major problem we needed to address was the years it took for the RMA to work through major nationally significant consents. You've got horror stories like of the Wellington inner city bypass that took 15 years to get through the resource consent process with objections and multiple appeals. A key innovation in our reforms has been the new national consenting process managed by the Environmental Protection Authority for those large nationally significant projects where the law requires a decision within nine months. The $1 billion Tahara Geothermal Power Project near Taupo was the first to be processed successfully within the required time frame, and last year the $2 billion Waterview Motorway Project was also approved with some modification in record time. The part that was most encouraging for me about the Waterview decision was a letter from the key opponents of that project, both being complimentary of the process in getting a fair hearing and feeling that the outcome was one that they could live with. These timely decisions are as important to the environment as the economy. Delays in consenting new renewable power stations simply means we burn more coal to keep the lights on. Years of delays in transport infrastructure means more years of highly congested traffic pollution and high fuel consumption levels. I said earlier I'd talk a little bit more about the crucial issue of fresh water in which land care is so involved. First, let me remind you of the issues New Zealand has in the management of that precious resource. There is increasing competition for water, both in terms of quantity and quality. Farmers, environmentalists, electricity generators, tourism operators, iwi and recreationists have all been battling for a piece of the pie. Although our water quality is relatively good by international standards, we are seeing areas of deterioration, particularly in lowland catchments, with one third of our lakes and a fifth of our rivers having uh, pollution problems. Add to this the increasing pressures of drinking water supplies, particularly during droughts, 
and the challenges that climate change uh, face, uh, challenges uh, face in respect of projections of drier periods in our eastern regions. The resource management framework is not working as efficiently as it should, and the hard decisions around water management are not being made when they need to be. The current system imposes unnecessary costs, there is inefficient use of fresh water, and the length of litigation it takes to get storage and other development projects underway is also inefficient. Clearly, improvements need to be made to the current regime to both maintain and increase the productivity we get from our fresh water resource and to ensure that it's protected for future generations. It's clear that both central and local government have not made full use of the tools that have been available to them under the RMA. National policy statements and national environment standards are needed to beef up the central government direction. About half of New Zealand's water catchments have limits set for water quantity, that's flow regimes, but only a very small number have clear limits on the level of contaminants that are allowed into those water bodies. The process of setting and managing limits is difficult for decision makers because it requires accommodating multiple and often competing values. The government's aim is to ensure that decisions achieve the best possible consideration of community, regional and national values while being timely, cost effective and ultimately for them to work being well supported by their community. We've made considerable progress in the first batch of changes with the Fresh Start for Fresh Water package. The budget announcements last year had three components relevant to improving fresh water management. Firstly, the national policy statement of fresh water, which I would note that in the first 18 years of the RMA, there was only uh, two national policy statements, and in our first term we delivered three NPSs. The second part was the new clean-up fund to support regional councils address historic pollution problems in nationally significant water bodies. And the third component is the irrigation fund to help deliver projects that would lift economic performance through the more efficient use of water and its storage. The national policy statement under the RMA on fresh water management sets out the government's clear expectations on councils on the importance of fresh water management. It directs councils to set limits for quality and quantity, to manage to those limits, to involve iwi, and to improve integrated management of both land and water. The NPS complements the irrigation and clean-up funds as it ensures limits are in place to keep in check the impacts of increased irrigation. It also ensures taxpayers' money for clean-up of historic pollution is contingent on having measures in place to manage current discharges. Detailed work to support the setting of limits for water quality and quantity is currently being undertaken by both the Land and Water Forum and the key officials working in this area. The first irrigation fund project has been announced on the 25th of January. Uh, the Hawke's Bay Regional Council are jointly to fund a $3.3 million full feasibility study on the Ruatanafa water storage project in that region. This takes total investments in the project so far to $4.8 million. The project has the potential to unlock enormous unrealised productivity in that Hawke's Bay region with the amount of irrigable land able to increase from 6,000 hectares to around 22,000 hectares. Most significantly for the local economy, it has the potential to provide security of water supply for those Hawke's Bay farmers, increase recreational opportunities, and improve those all-important summer flows uh, in their rivers. The Fresh Start for Fresh Water Cleanup Fund will commit $101 million to clean up over the first four years, including this year, uh, from this government. This compares to just $17 million, or one-sixth of the amount spent in the preceding four years and I have to say, trying to squeeze that sort of money out of the Treasury in current financial times is a measure of the importance the government does give 
to this work on improving management of our fresh water. The clean-up fund assists councils with historic pollution problems, but we've been very clear with communities that a prerequisite for the government providing funding is that clear limits are put in place so that it is not simply subsidising ongoing pollution and crucial for the concept behind Landcare Trust that there is broad collaboration of all the stakeholders in the community to those clean up plans. The first four projects, Lake Taupo, Rotorua Lakes, the Waikato River and Lake Ellesmere, Te Waihora have already been announced and are underway. Announcements of the next four projects to receive support from the government's Fresh Start for Freshwater Fund will be made by the Prime Minister at the Blue Greens Forum on Saturday on the North Shore. When it comes to resource management, it's also time to step back from pursuing simply piecemeal and technical improvements. We need to look at managing our resources in a more systematic and coherent way. We need to get our approach to these strategic issues right whether we're talking about fresh water, about planning, or about the important issues around infrastructure. To function well, our resource management system needs a strong focus on the core strategic issues like governance, the rights and interests of Māori and water, and information to support better decision making. Right now, we have a unique opportunity to develop approaches that are relevant to our wider resource management system through the work that is being done as part of those freshwater management reforms. I am absolutely delighted at the progress that has been achieved by the Land and Water Forum and in finding agreement on the problems. The great value of the Land and Water Forum is that it is building a consensus view of the best mix of economic, environmental, cultural benefits from New Zealand's freshwater resource. The Land and Water Forum is the number one example of communities from across the country collaborating to influence how our vital resource of water is managed nationally. The LUF's work provides a unique opportunity for the government to develop approaches using water as a working example for issues relevant to our wider resource management system. And one of the key topics at our Blue Greens Forum this weekend is where are there other areas in which the sort of collaborative model of which was started with the Landcare Trust in New Zealand, expanded with the work of the Land and Water Forum, where else are the areas where that model can help lift our game? So what is the role of communities in this environmental management? Let me remind you of two freshwater cleanup projects where communities are successfully working together to achieve significant environmental outcomes for their region in some of New Zealand's iconic freshwater areas, the Taupo and Rotorua Lakes. In these projects, we have farmers trading nitrogen and local iwi involved in projects including monitoring native Kura populations. Local restaurants are marketing local beef with the Waikato Regional Council Environmental Standard Tick for protecting Lake Taupo, and I understand you're going to hear more about Taupo beef uh, later this morning. Can I tell you that work in Taupo around nitrogen trading is globally world leading, and in forums that I've participated around the environment in Beijing in China and the OECD in Paris, that work in Lake Taupo is seen as a model forward, and interestingly, countries are making approaches to our government to share some of our expertise and models in dealing with those very challenging issues uh, of how to improve water quality and the innovation of both the collaboration uh, and using financial instruments like the nitrogen trading model that's being used in Lake Taupo. Last year, I also announced funding from the Community Environment Fund for a local initiative to use recycled Coke bottles to develop floating wetlands and Rotorua lakes to help improve water quality by removing nitrogen from the lake water. The success of these community-led projects is testament to how, by working together, communities can achieve common environmental objectives. Landcare Trust has been a key leader in a number of projects nationwide, and I encourage them and all of you to stay involved in community action to achieve environmental outcomes. Uh, it's impossible as Minister for me to be familiar, Nick, with all your work over the country. But frankly, if it's half as good as what I see in my own community in Nelson and Marlborough, 
you have a huge amount of which to be proud. To take community environmental management further, the government has taken steps to encourage more groups to become involved. For example, a project cannot get funding from the government's Fresh Start for Fresh Water Fund unless it has partners from the community committed to the project, in particular local iwi, and I would encourage the Land Care Trust with the announcements on Saturday to ensure that it is part at that community level of those water cleanup projects. Communities need to be part of projects, cleaning up historic sites, but they also need to be committed to making sure that mistakes of the past are not repeated. I'd also like to take this opportunity to encourage you to consider the environmental champions that are part of every community. Yes, funding's important, but as I think we saw last night, and is so familiar part of Landcare, is that there is tremendous community input and volunteer commitment to making such projects work, and it's important that we salute those people. I recently called for nominations for this year's Green Ribbon Awards. There are 12 categories under which individuals or groups who have made significant contributions to improving our environment can be recognised. I'd encourage the network of land care groups through to New Zealand to help us identify those quiet champions in our community that really do deserve to be recognised and to be able to champion the work of land care. Later this morning you will hear from Andrew Fisher from Eco Stock Supplies. EcoStock was last year's Supreme Green Ribbon Award winner. The company has grown significantly on the back of that award and their hard work. I'm sure you'll find the story inspiring. In my view, it is a classic example of where there are opportunities for New Zealand in that green growth space of actually being able to find ideas that are good for the environment that also create jobs and wealth for our country. In conclusion, I've talked about my environmental priorities, the work around the exclusive economic zone, the environmental reporting new act, and reforms of our Resource Management Act. In particular, I've talked about improving management of our freshwater resources and the good progress that's been made over the last three years with the Land and Water Forum, and the important work ahead on implementation of the National Policy Statement for Freshwater and the further work that's required around national environment standards. I see the next three years as consolidation of that progress. I look forward to receiving LUF's reports firstly in April on limit setting and in September on allocation in which to advance that work further. In the meantime, projects funded through both the Fresh Start for Freshwater Cleanup Fund and the Irrigation Fund will be getting underway. This is an exciting time. I look forward to those challenges ahead and again, I want to thank Landcare for the huge contribution it is making from Kaitaia to Bluff in assisting the government in its ambitions for us to be both a rich country, but a country that properly stewards its tremendous natural resources. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Minister, for a, a very exciting and engaging speech. Uh, with very direct relevance to our delegates here today and our conference. A uh, slight change to the program. Our Minister does have to return to the House of uh, Representatives this morning, uh, but he's indicated to me that he would like to take a few questions from the delegates. So those who would like to ask a question, if you could put your hand up, the Minister will identify you, you will be given a mic, and if you could just state your name and who you're representing, that would be great. Thank you. Minister, it's David Craig from the Arfidu Peninsula Group, which is in Port Hutchison country. I'll give you credit, I don't usually um, say nice things about MP, but you, I think you're probably one of the better ones. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you, the, the thing is I like to talk about, you say funding issues. Well, funding issues, when you're a land care group, we've been going on the, in the 17th year now, which we started before the New Zealand Land Care Trust even started. But one thing we find difficult is funding and member burnout. And member burnout is basically caused by funding issues. We have a lot of central government rules passed down to uh, local governments, 
and they want things like outstanding natural landscapes protected and everything else. And when it comes around, there's a lot of people in the land care groups would love to protect those things, but there isn't the funding issue, the funding there available to do it. And we spend most of our volunteer time trying to get funding to do different projects. And even if you give money from to keep the local New Zealand Land Care Trust going, it's a pittance really compared to what's really needed. These are volunteer groups. And basically, I think I'm on about the third time it's convener now because everybody's burnt out and I'm still there. But I just want to know, you know, is there in the future going to be more funding? I, I know it's a, a dirty word, but this group of networking um, land care groups need more funding. Mm. I, I fear challenge. Um, I've been uh, privileged to be a member of parliament for the last 21 years and a minister uh, in about eight different portfolios. And to be frank with you, I've never known a time in which government funds have been in such short supply. I think the Prime Minister noted recently a cabinet meeting, it would be really nice to have a cabinet meeting when we were deciding who we're going to give some money rather than who we're going to take it off. Uh, and those, in my view, those very tight fiscal times are likely to continue. Now, despite that, and simply because I am a very strong uh, advocate uh, of land care, uh, was able to uh, effectively double the base funding that's provided for land care. Where I would have an invitation for your own group and for others around the country is in terms of the Community Environment Fund and the Sustainable Management Fund that's run by my colleague David Carter in the agricultural space. Uh, I am wanting to rejig the criteria for those funds to put greater emphasis on two parts of our blue-green view. One, the collaboration, which sounds like a, a tired record, but I'm serious about it. And the second is being practical. And those things are very much so. I don't individually decide as minister who gets money out of that community environment fund, but I do determine the criteria, and I am putting greater emphasis in the criteria on practical projects and projects that involve collaboration and invite groups like of Landcare to have more applications going into that fund to try and get some more support. The second part uh, that I think your challenge is fear is I worry that we as a country spend ginormous sums of money on resource management processes and legal disputes. And too much on lawyers, too much on disputes, and not enough on practical effort. Uh, and I think your challenge is a fair one, and I think it is one for both councils and for government about how we can do, not put more funding in, because there ain't more money, but how can we redirect more funds into collaborative practical projects. And I just, a little bit of a teaser, is my colleague uh, Jackie Dean, uh, who's a member of parliament for Otago, has been trying to get a collaborative process involved in Mackenzie around that particular area where there are some really big challenges, an iconic area, uh, agriculture and dryland country that's very challenging. And to get the councils to put up $5,000 to help a collaborative process has been seen as hugely challenging, but they'd comfortably spend a million bucks on legal disputes through the Environment Court. I think there's a job that I'm attempting to lead, but I'd appreciate the support of land care groups in persuading people to spend less money on resource management legal disputes and more money on the practical work that land care trusts do throughout New Zealand. Uh, Al Fleming from Forest and Bird. Uh, thanks for your speech, Minister. I've been recently involved in the Rena oil spill and the use of armed forces to assist in that was um, much appreciated and well received by the community. Has the government considered using uh, armed forces in projects such as uh, riparian planting, et cetera? Yeah, um, like you, and can I acknowledge those from the Bay of Plenty, not just actually the army, but the part that has been truly amazing in the recovery of the RENA is the number, thousands, of community volunteers who are prepared to give up their time freely to assist in that cleanup. The cautiousness that I have about the military being involved more extensively in environmental planting and that type of work 
uh, is in an emergency type situation of arena absolutely appropriate, they're good at that stuff. But fundamentally, our armed services are around a defence function. And, and so apart from emergency type situations like Savrina, uh, my view uh, is that our armed services are primarily uh, for their defence role, and I'm sure the Minister of Defence, as much as I'd love to abscond even 10% of his military budget for my environmental pet projects, I suspect I won't get away with it. Minister, uh, it's Norm Barker from Waikato Regional Council. Councillor, um, you, you, you've, uh, you've commented on our Variation 5, which was uh, the Lake Taupo uh, progress, and our Variation 6 around water allocation, uh, our co-management stuff that we're doing as well. So we, do, we feel like we're getting good momentum going, and then we hear in the listener article that regional councils might not be around. So uh, just, I wonder if you could comment on that, please. Yeah. Uh, as part of the reshuffle post-election, I picked up the local government portfolio, I asked for it, and I need to be plain that I do think uh, that there is opportunity for government to get our reforms in the resource management space and what we're doing in the local government area uh, improved, and I want to reassure you uh, that the government has made no formal decisions in the area of local government reform. Uh, but I do want to give you a bit of a steer of the challenge. The first is that the substantive reform of local authorities in Auckland does mean a substantial challenge for the rest of the country. That is that Auckland has been pretty divided and pretty disorganised for a long time and having its act together does pose a challenge for the rest of New Zealand. The second is that if you look at the core of the work, and I think Landcare would acknowledge it, if you look at the work of the Land and Water Forum, if we are to step up our environmental management, we need to be able to better integrate together the decisions around land use and the issues of water. And I am not convinced that the structure we have at the moment with the regional councils and the district councils being separate, having their own complex regional policy statement and regional plans and the district council having theirs, I am not satisfied that that is either doing it most efficiently or delivering the environmental goods. I am expressing a view that the unitary council model that's been adopted in Auckland that operates in Gisborne and my own area of the country is a model that, in my view, offers efficiency gains. But I'm equally clear that we need to take a catchment-based approach. That is, and I'm at heart a civil engineer, and that is that if you look at a complex river system like you have here in the Waikato, there is no way that you're ever going to put this, the town of Taupo and Hamilton into the same council and you are going to need to manage a river like the Waikato uh, as a single entity if you're going to do so competently both from a water quality and an allocation perspective. So yes, I think there is potential to expand the Unitary Council model in New Zealand, but I also say that there are areas of New Zealand such as the Waikato, I suspect Canterbury, I suspect the Clutha in Otago, uh, where you're going to need some such body that's able to manage those river systems on a catchment-wide basis. So yes, uh, the government is exploring uh, issues around local government reform. We expect to be in a position to make some announcements in the next month or two, but hopefully I've given you a little bit of a flavour as to what some of the underlying thinking is going into the drivers for local government reform and improving how we deliver both economically and environmentally. Um, Fred Litwark, Whangaroa Harbour Care in Raglan. Um, totally agree with the comments that you just put forward then. Um, catchment management is definitely something that uh, we support, being a catchment management group. But something that um, I'd like to raise your attention to is the neglect that is of our harbours, particularly the West Coast harbours. Aotea, Kafia, Raglan, the Kuipras popped up, you know, and we've got uh, serious um, pollution threats, misuse of that resource, and as you're probably aware, one of the uh, best economic um, gains that could be made uh, in New Zealand is looking after that marine nursery. Um, we have point source discharges, no stock exclusion areas, and really being mismanaged and totally support the freshwater um, incentives that are coming up, but we really do need to be looking at, too, in my opinion, um, 
these harbours that are also just as, if not more, valuable. Mm, can I accept your challenge? It was fascinating last night talking to our Aussie friends, and I'm extremely reluctant to ever accept the Aussies can do things better than us. Uh, but I think the way in which the land care movement in Australia has also incorporated coast care is something that I think Nick, land care needs to think about and in government uh, we need to think about. Um, we have in the last three years adopted a new national policy statement uh, around coastal management including our estuaries but in my view uh, if we get on top and that is my primary ambition this three year term on to our freshwater management issues. The challenge you pose in respect of coastal management is quite true, and in my view there is the potential, of which I saw very strongly in the Bay of Plenty, around the Rena disaster, the level of community interest that I think we could engender in a similar model to what has been done in respect of land care around coast care, and that may be a potential for expansion. So point well made. Uh, Minister, just wondering, um how are we going to capitalise on all the great work we've seen done through the Landcare Trust to date? Like yesterday we heard some really good examples of where farmers have taken action and you know, harbour groups have done amazing plantings. But then we hear from the markets that they're not interested in that, they, they, they're still priced, very much price focused, which is fair enough, but somehow we've got to have a, a view or a, or a a strategy to capitalise on that better environmental management, which is where we're heading. And if we're going to get any money, more money funding into environmental management, then it needs to be a payoff, and it payoff needs to come from the markets. So how are we going to do that? Yeah, um, a very pertinent question. The first thing is, when you're a little country like New Zealand, you have to accept what the market demands and not somehow pretend that you can change the view of 7 billion consumers in the world. And the truth is, for the consumers of our primary products, price, food safety, is consistently ranking ahead of the environmental sustainability type issues that Landcare and me as Minister for the Environment are very focused on. And that's the reality, and we shouldn't be afraid of that. It is, there is clear evidence to show that the importance of the environmental sustainability part of that equation is there, but we should be cautious of not overcooking the book and pretending that our consumers are not interested in issues of price and issues of food safety because all our evidence is that they rake first. Now, the government's been very interested in the point you raise, and that is how can New Zealand leverage more value off our clean green brand? And I invite you to read the report that I'll be releasing on Saturday called the Green Growth Advisory Group. We commissioned this group 12 months ago asking that very question, and they have produced a very substantive report about the extra things that both government and uh, groups in the primary industries can do to try and leverage off more value. Part of it is about ensuring the integrity of it, and that's where the Environment Reporting Act and the expanded role of the Parliamentary Commissioner for the Environment is part of it but also part of it is a marketing and how we position. So I'd invite you to have a look at that Green Growth Advisory Report that we we're releasing on Saturday, see whether you concur with their ideas about addressing the point you raise. The government will not be announcing decisions on Saturday, but we're keen to get feedback from people like you in the sector as to whether their recommendations are on the right track for tackling that challenge. Thank you. Uh, Minister, um, Julian Fitter, Makatu Onatra Wetland Society. Um, Going back to the first questioner, um, finding funds for small groups is tricky, uh, but one of the problems we've come across, and it's one I'm sure is common with many groups, is when you're successful, there is a great need for management within the group. Uh, and one of the problems with the funding is it's very difficult to get funding for management, and yet without that management, the group actually will tend to sort of stagnate and eventually possibly cease to exist. So is there any way that you can, from the top, you might say, uh, encourage either government or agencies or local councils to actually release, uh, allow the funding to be used not just for projects, but actually for management? Yeah. There's a tension there, and that is, whether it be the council or whether it be government, 
they're always going to have a preference for their money being spent on real things rather than the administrative function. Yet you and I know that when it comes to the actual hard yards of doing work, there is a cost there, and if it's not done well, you end up with disasters. And I can tell you a few community-led environmental projects that have badly underspent on management and end up with a complete mess. Uh, so I accept your challenge. Um, I feel that I've sort of done a bit of it in doubling the funding uh, for the Land Care Trust at a national level, uh, because it is my view that you need that national structure to be able to get the gains that is available from Land Care. Uh, other than that, I can just simply take on board your challenge and make sure in the way in which we manage our portions, the Sustainable Farming Fund and the Community Environment Fund, that we are not ignorant of the need for community groups like your own to have some funding that can drive that community stuff. The other invitation that I'd give you, where you've got key milestones that you're achieving in your community environment projects, I want to be a champion for you and where I can be parts of in your community in coming and championing those causes and meeting with your local authorities and encouraging them to shift resource. There's not more money out there, but I actually think Landcare can make a successful case for shifting money out of some of the adversarial processes that deliver stuff all and delivering it into the practical and community collaborative processes that actually do have a capacity to make a material difference for the environment. Thank you very much. Good to see you. Thank you, Minister.